The San Francisco 49ers in Minnesota. Joint practices happening with the Vikings. How did the 49ers fare practicing against another squad for the first time in camp? We'll get to that. Uh, notes on Trey Lance from camp. Notes from the offensive line. What it's looking like there. Uh, and I think there's a couple of position battles on defense that have already been settled, Croc, early in camp. All that and more coming up on today's Locked On 49ers. <laughs> You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On 49ers. Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker with you as always at BD Peacock at Eric underscore Crocker. Thanks for making us your first listen here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Niners in Minnesota and some pretty nice facilities they got over there. George Kittle after practice talking about how nice it was and how much space. And they have two. So they have I think they have like four practice fields, right? Which? And a hundred yard field, and they have like a, a a a field with like stands and its own press box and like this big jumbotron screen just for the practice. It looks like a like a you could have an NFL game at one of their practice fields. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I'd assume that they probably have like high school teams that play there. Dallas Cowboys do that, right? Like Dallas Cowboys have this beautiful uh, uh, facility that they recently built, and they play like high school football games there, state championships, all that, right? So um, it's that type of size. I have been to the Minnesota facilities. Uh, I was out there. Matter of fact, I was there. The 49ers played the Dallas Cowboys uh, in the playoffs on a Saturday, I believe, right? So that Thursday and Friday, I was actually in uh, Minnesota, and I was uh, evaluating some prospects that were going to be entering the draft. And the training facility where they're at, there's like this health and wellness center right there connected. It's all connected. So everything has like the Vikings logos. Everything is Vikings color. And it was beautiful where I was training them too. You look out the window and at this time it was snowing. So you just see snow all over everything. And you see all like, it's all like these big glass windows. Like it was, it was crazy. But I got a chance to see, you know, where the Vikings practice. And it's beautiful. A lot of land out there. And I heard George Kittle talking about how it's just so much land. And it's pretty much like that. Like, it was like they, there's this big chunk of land that probably just had nothing on there. And they're like, you know what? Let's just buy this whole piece of land and just build this nice state-of-the-art uh, wellness center and training facility for the Minnesota Vikings. So it is it is a pretty place. It gets cold. It was, I mean, it, when I was there, there was snow all on the ground. It was snowing. It was all kind of crazy stuff, but a beautiful place. The, the only big time college football game I've ever seen, the college I went to, I, I went to, and in fact, my the junior college I went to, the community college, Butte, with Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback, probably would, uh, I mean, that was the, the biggest college uh, team that I ever, you know, went to school with because it's SF State. We didn't even have a football program, so I have no rooting interest. So I never really been to any big time college football games, uh, you know, seen a, a Stanford game and, and a Cal game. And th they didn't feel like big time football games. They were big football games. But uh, I saw Wisconsin against the Minnesota uh, gophers you know badgers versus gophers big time rivalry there but it was in wisconsin but it was snowing and it was really cool to see a big time like people who cared about college football tailgating for weeks before the game like it was important and it was snowing it was a really cool atmosphere so um yeah it, it's different up minnesota there. they're uh the minnesota gophers their football i got to matter of fact my boy my boy uh boy mafe boy mafe showed mm -hmm. me around uh, all the facilities. He's now a Seahawk. He just got drafted to the Seahawks and uh, got a sack, a sack strip fumble in his first preseason Look game. Look good. Yeah. But he he uh, showed me and my son around the entire uh, facility. He worked with one of my athletes out here in Arkansas. I took my uh, athlete up there one time. And uh, yeah, I mean, you you see the the Minnesota the college stadium there in like smack down kind of downtown. Uh, Minneapolis or Twin Cities or St. Paul, wherever the hell it is, it's like all connect, kind of connected, I guess. But um, beautiful place. And I can deal with it when the summer is good. I mean, when the weather is good. And I've been there when it was cold. I've been there when it was warm. Uh, but cool, cool, cool little place. Croc's not into the snow. I am not into the snow. I, and I live in Arkansas 
we typically don't get snow every blue moon we'll, we'll get some snow and there was like a blizzard like a year ago it got like to like three three degrees out here and there was snow oh, everywhere uh but yeah i don't really do the snow 49ers practice notes with those Minnesota Vikings, and uh, we got to start with the quarterback and and Trey Lance. He was 11 of 17, according to Eric Branch of the Chronicle, uh, in his first joint practice with the Vikings. Uh, but the thing that worries me is, and we've talked about how the you know the stats isn't really a big deal, so whatever. 11 to 17, uh, under steady pressure, and I've heard this from almost everybody that was there. There was four quote unquote sacks, according to most people. Uh, they're touch sacks, you know, they're not completely hitting each other and, and not trying to hurt each other or anything like that. But four sacks, and some of his completions were a bit off target and somewhat behind receivers. And timing seemed to be a bit off for the 49ers offense. And, and I think that's been one of the things with Trey Lance is like, okay, accuracy and timing, those things. When he's able to get out and make a play, he can make a play. He's a playmaker. Uh, he's got a good arm. You know, obviously he's got um, athletic ability, but it's the timing stuff and, and, and the quick hitters and, um, and, and the, I don't even know if it's anticipation as much as just pure accuracy that those are the things that I think Trey Lance needs to work on. But what worries me more is it's hard for him to be the best version of himself if he can't be kept clean. And when you see the 49ers offensive line losing against opponents, it's one thing to be beaten by Nick Bosa all day long. And, and apparently Nick Bosa was unblockable again against the Minnesota Vikings offensive lineman. But uh, we'll go to our guy, Brad Graham, who we hung out with at 49ers practices, and he said overall it was a clunky day for the 49ers offense. Vikings defensive line was giving the 49ers offensive line fits for the majority of the day. Didn't feel like the running lanes were opening up and pass protection was suspect. So those are two really important things for Trey Lance, and it all hinges on the offensive line. What's going to help a young quarterback? A running game is going to help. What's going to help a young quarterback is good pass protection. If the 49ers don't have that this year, it could be a rough year for a, a, a huge developmental season for Trey Lance. Right, and we've talked about kind of, you know the accuracy, and you want to do everything you can to help him out there. One thing that has been fairly consistent is when he has time to be able to set up and you know kind of plant his feet and make throws, he can be accurate enough, right? Like you said, there was a pass that was like maybe slightly behind someone and whatnot. I think that's kind of going to be him until he gets another opportunity to kind of rework some of the mechanics come this offseason. But right now, just get the ball in the vicinity of guys. That, that, that's cool. That'll work for now. And then be the playmaker. We've heard about him being the playmaker off script, even in these practices. But what you can't have is him under constant duress and how difficult that could be and what that does to a guy mental. So I'd say in in the game, there are ways to kind of slow down the pass rush, which things they probably weren't doing in a, you know, training camp practice, you know, screens. Screens is the go-to. All right, you guys want to rush upfield? You're being on offensive line. All right, we're going to invite you upfield, and we're going to throw the ball out to Debo Samuel, and we're going to let him do his magic, right? And that'll kind of slow down the rush a little bit. Okay, you want to get upfield right now? Boom, hit you with a quarterback draw right now. So there are ways to kind of counter it in games that they wouldn't necessarily do in a joint practice. But you still, it's not, it's not, it's not ideal. You want to fix it. And, and I also heard, you know, even during the practice. Well, McKivitz is playing, I believe he was at right tackle, and yep. he's just kind of getting destroyed. And at least you feel kind of good that, well, it's not going to be McKivitz Maybe playing there at right tackle. Okay. Uh, McGlinchey will be there, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people will be like, oh, my goodness, I've never been happier to hear the name McGlinchey, uh, and hopefully he comes back soon. But if not, what do you think about, and again, you don't want to change what this guy's been learning, but Spencer Burford, this is a guy who played right tackle, in college, I mean, we're left tackle in college, excuse yeah. me, played guard the first couple of years, then played left tackle. But is he a guy where you're like, man, we just cannot play McKivitz out there. We can't play school out there. Gosh, do we have to move this rookie and put him at right tackle? Well, we had talked about this at, uh, at practice. And I don't know if, if, if I was talking with you about this or if this is after you left and, and I was talking to, you know, Jordan and, and Brad and, and some other folks after you were gone on Sunday, but I think there could potentially be, because when you see Spencer Burford, especially when you see him in person and his height weight isn't really on paper, doesn't look wowing, but you see him, he looks like he's built like a tackle. He's kind of got the yeah. long arms and he's got that build of like, okay, that looks like an offensive tackle. Um, Do you think it's the number two though? Cause he had number 74, it's 74 on which yeah, it's, you know, it yeah. Shout out to just David. Gave away that number a little too soon in my opinion, but uh, I'm not in charge of no, those things. No, hold on. Okay. Hold on. We got to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> when, when's the right time to give away a number for I feel like you have to rip the bandaid off and do it right now and just no. kind of show right now like we will 
So my other people will be wearing number 74. No, you, you wait a while. You wait a while. Wait for what? It, 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 the longer you right. wait, the, I feel like the more it's like because no, nobody's going to wear this number. No, then it becomes like a rebound. You know when you have a long-term girlfriend or something, uh, and then you go and, and date another girl right away, it feel it's it's you know you, you it's like the rebound. You don't want to. You're not going to put a ring on her finger right away. So that's the way I feel oh, about. Man. You, you, now you're starting to look for the perfect fit for someone to wear a 74. And no, I, it doesn't have to be like, that. No, it's, it's just, just another number. It just you have to take some time. It, it just you got to take some time, and because you have to kind of wait and see. It's like, man, does maybe does he deserve to have, you know, his uniform not ever worn again? Like you got to kind of think nah, about this, thing. See, no, and, and no, you got to no. you got to let it marinate. You got to take some time. It took the it took the San Francisco Giants. 25 years too long to retire will clark's jersey and they finally retired it at 20 you know number 22 right sometimes those things don't happen overnight you got to wait you got to think about it you, you got to give it some time you don't give it away right away um it, it's not even it's not that big of a deal but it, it's a little too soon it is weird seeing guys wear um uniforms numbers from guys who were who were big time players jerry rice i get it time. montana i get it steve young i get it but and even Frank Orr is kind of on the edge. And there was a lot of backlash when they tried to put somebody in number 21. But outside of that, I mean, it's like Joe Staley was a terrific football player. Yeah, he got it. He got it. He got it. Somebody got to get that. 97. B.Y.'s in the Hall of Fame. And there's a guy right now wearing his number. So you almost have to turn 97 into this number where, because Nick Bosa might himself go into the Hall of Fame. So 97 always becomes the, like, number three at Notre Dame and, and whatever number it is at, what number is it at? at number USC. one at Michigan uh, for receiver. Yeah, number I think uh, number seven for the right? LSU defense. Yes, that's a good one. That's another good one. Yeah, so I wonder if 97 could become that for the 49ers because they can't really retire that many numbers because they've retired so many already. You're going to run out of numbers, so I get that too. But you could wait a little bit. Uh, it's only been a year since uh, Joe Staley retired, right? Or has it been two years? I don't know. Two years now. This five will be year two. Five years feels right. Wait, just wait, wait a while. Just wait a little while. Um, all right. So I, I want to talk about Spencer Burford. What his future might be with the San Francisco 49ers. So I've had these thoughts already about what uh, what position he might play. And maybe it's not right guard long term for the 49ers. Some specific throws and catches from Trey Lance and Debo Samuel and Danny Gray at training camp practice, which players are coming back, which players are hurt. Tons more notes from Minnesota coming up. But as far as, I mean, we're talking about gearing up for fall, getting ready for, um, you know, the fall, this, the, the winter season, the, the holiday season. You might be needing to gear up for your business and hiring the right people to your team and helping your small business fire on all cylinders. Well, LinkedIn jobs is here to make it easier for you to do those things. LinkedIn jobs is here to make it easier to find people you want to talk to faster and for free, create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job to the purple hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile uh, to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help find the right people for you to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to speak to and who you want to interview and potentially hire. It's why small business rates LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks again, everybody, for making Locked On 49ers your first listen every day. For your second listen, make sure you're checking out Peacock and Williamson daily. Make sure you're checking out Locked On NFL Draft and make sure you're checking out Locked On Fantasy Football and Locked On Dynasty. It is Fantasy Week next week, starting August 22nd. We're bringing you daily top 10 lists for Fantasy Draft Week. Locked On Fantasy Football and Locked On Dynasty available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, Croc, on the subject of Spencer Burford and uh, just looking at how things are going in camp, looking at how things might go. And I don't think you have to do it this year. It, Mike McGlinchey is, is here. He's on his fifth-year option. 
but you're paying a lot of money to your left tackle. You're paying a lot of money to Debo Samuel. You're paying a lot of money to Nick Bosa very soon. You're And, and he's going to be on his fifth year contract, which is going to be big anyway as a number two overall pick. So Nick Bosa is going to be expensive very soon. Uh, you know, Kittle, Warner, you're paying a lot of guys a lot of money, even with a cheaper quarterback. And look, Trey Lance, even as the number three pick, is going to be pretty expensive pretty soon too. He, he's not going to be as cheap as if you drafted a quarterback in the third round or something like that. So are you going to be able to pay Mike McGlinchey what uh, an, a starting offensive tackle that was drafted top 10? Those guys on their second contracts make a lot of money, even if they're not upper echelon players. And I don't think McGlinchey necessarily is. And I like McGlinchey. I like his personality. I think the 49ers really like the person, like his character. They like having him around. Can they afford to pay him? And if they can't, is maybe the plan bumping in year two Spencer Burford out from right guard to right tackle to replace McGlinchey on the cheap? And then our guy, Jason Poe, who's been almost undefeated in camp. Like, you cannot cut this dude, even though he's an undrafted free agent. Then letting him jump in at right guard, where he's been playing a lot and taking a lot of reps in camp. Now you have your young right guard, right tackle combo of the future. Croc, what do you think? I think that's a that's a good long term goal. Again, uh, McGlinchey. I mean, his fifth year option is picked up, so he's guaranteed to be on the roster. So if you say, "All right, we're going to let these guys at least adjust to the speed of the game," there is no uh, just rush to get a guy like Poe out there, and he can wait a couple years to where he really kind of develops, and then you want to kind of bump some guys out and put a guy like Poe inside. I think that is a good long term goal. If you feel like, okay, McGlinchey's not the guy. Now, the tough thing is, by then, we're talking about year three, and a guy like Spencer Burford, well, he's only going to have like one more year before he's a free agent. <laughs> so, that, you know, you're not going to get as much value having him out there, at, you know, at tackle but before you have to eventually resign him if you wait a couple years before McGlinchey has to leave. So uh, that's a tough little uh, decision that they'll have to make. Ideally, you would like to be able to put Spencer Burford out there next season to where you get a couple years before you have to actually kind of have those conversations of resigning them. But uh yeah, just in general, that would be a good plan. So M McGlinchey's already on his fifth year option, isn't he? Isn't he in year no. five? Now? No, they picked it up. He's year four. What year was he drafted? Was twenty eight? Mm, it was the oh no, it was the it was the draft that we did live with yeah, Dylan. Shout out Dylan D. Simone. I haven't heard from that guy in years. I don't know what where, where that guy disappeared to. I think but Dylan was, just got married. I did he? Oh, congratulations, to Dylan. Um, I think no, so. that was 2018. That was the Fred Warner draft too, 2018, right? Right. Yeah. So that means so, 18, 19. So yeah, you're, this is he's on his fifth year option this year. So this is the last year. Are you sure? Yeah, I think so. 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nah. Okay. Maybe that that plan might kick in <laughs> sooner than I thought. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah, his his salary jumped up to 10 million dollars this year. Under 10.8 mil is what Mike McGlinchey's making on his fifth year option this year. So oh, yeah, and yeah. Spencer Burford next year at Good. right tackle, man. You you can you can pencil that in right now. Matter of fact, write it with a pen, write it with a sharpie. <laughs> Crocs into it. Crocs into it. Otherwise, I mean, uh, offensive tackle is an important position. It's an expensive position. Otherwise, you're drafting an offensive tackle with the earliest pick you have in the draft, and the 49ers don't have a first-round pick next year. So you're drafting it. You're either spending on a different free agent offensive tackle, so why not just re-sign Mike McGlinchey? Or you're drafting a guy in the second round and hoping he can start for you. And we saw how that went with Aaron Banks last year. Uh, and, it, you know, even if it's a higher second round pick, that can be dicey as well. So I kind of like the Burford plan at right tackle potentially long term. And I, I think he yeah. can handle the way he looks. And he's really, his pass sets are great. Like that's, I think he's better pass blocker than a run blocker right now. Or potentially left tackle because, I, and I know, I mean, we look at Trent Williams. And he looks amazing, and we feel like this is just never going to stop. But he is like 34 years old, right? So at some point, you know, Trent Williams is going to have to say, you know what, it's been a great run. I've made a lot of money. It's time to kind of walk away from the game. I mean, is he still going to be playing at 36, 37 years old? So uh, I think there's an opportunity for maybe Spencer Burford to be your future left tackle, potentially. Wow. Now, again, yeah, I don't know how often you want to keep, you know, flip-flopping them from side to side, but he was a left tackle in college. I know he's playing right guard now. Will he be able to make that transition back to the left, or do you want to say, you know what, stay on the right side? Looking at Trent Williams, and like the how, 
the the level that Trent Williams is still playing at, you don't want to push him out the door or anything like that. And looking at his contract, it does start to grow next year. Uh, they they backloaded his deal quite a bit, and I'm surprised. I, I didn't realize how long he was still signed for. He's signed through 2026, his age 38 season. I don't think he's going to see that. It's It jumps up to $32 million base salary, and none of it is guaranteed. So the 49ers would save $33 million by cutting him before that uh, age 38 season in 2026 could he play at this level all the way through 2025 and 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 collect you know 22 and a half million dollars that year um you know that's certainly possible i'm looking at 2024 as maybe the the logical final year at age 36 for trent williams and then you see how it goes for 2025 i doubt he would see his age 38 2026 season but you know at some point he would potentially start to slow down uh, and it is a backloaded contract, but I didn't realize how long that contract went all the way through 2026. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah, I that's... they did. I thought they did it like that with the intentions of not keeping him like throughout the entirety of the contract. It's it, it'll be really easy for them to get out of it in the last couple of years of it for sure. And, and even, you know, even earlier too, if they wanted to. So, um, and yeah, who knows how long Trent Williams actually wants to play, but yeah, you, it, you, have, you essentially sometime soon, could need to replace both tackles. So maybe the plan should be let's hold on and re-sign McGlinchey and see if we can get through the next couple of years and then maybe Burford or somebody else needs to come play left tackle. Uh, one thing I, I thought I would have seen right uh, so far in camp that we have not seen is Jason Poe taking snaps at center. And he hasn't taken any snaps to center. He's been at, at mostly right guard. He's played some left guard as well, but no center. And I think that would be a huge indication that they want him to make the roster if he did take some snaps at center. But one thing I did see reported from practice is that Nick Sakel, the sixth round pick, took his first snaps at center in practice in Minnesota. So is that them just trying to, to see if Nick Sakel can make the roster? Do they like Sakel because they they you know they drafted him and they didn't draft um didn't draft Jason Poe. Do they like Zakel more, even though Poe's been better in practices? And they're trying to see if if Zakel can stick on the roster, or are they giving Zakel a shot at center just as a last ditch effort to say, well, he's not going to make the roster at guard. Maybe if he can back up center, he'd be valuable enough. And if he can't handle center, then he's not going to be on the roster. So there's still some long term ramifications because if I was a team and I was watching the 49ers closely, I'd be probably telling, you know, if I was a scout, you know, and I was. I was watching the games and I was assigned to the 49ers. I'd be saying, look, if Jason Poe gets cut, you got to claim him. If uh, Marcelino McCrary ball gets cut, you got to claim him. Right. I don't think people are saying that about Nick's account. Right. Right. So this, yeah, this would be the perfect opportunity. Just see what type of versatility he has. Uh, if you do want to keep him. You, you, the interesting thing with the 49ers and some of their rookies right now, guys are making plays. And they're kind of finding their niche in like where they can play. You see it with Samuel Womack. You see it with, uh, you talked about Poe. Obviously, we know what Buford is doing. I mean, there's Danny Gray. He's doing his thing. And I and I think for a roster that's pretty loaded, I think the 49ers have one of the better rosters in the league. And, and I saw one of the comments while we were recording our last show where one of our listeners was like, why, why does this roster continue to get disrespected? Listen, I don't know. But I do know one thing. I figured it would be a tough, difficult roster for a rookie to really crack or even make the team and to see as many guys as they've gotten to be this productive early on and we'll see if you know how that transitions to the actual regular season but it, that's not the norm so if Zakiel was just like did not make it <laughs> I mean not every one of these guys is going to hit no it's tough it's tough for sixth and seventh round draft picks to hit and there's there's a put it this way I mean, there's a lot more of them that exist, but there's a lot more undrafted free agents in the league than there are sixth and seventh rounders. And that's sort of a numbers game too, because it's not because the, the undrafted guys are better necessarily. It's just that there's more of them. Um, all right. Let's talk about two defensive positions, nickel, strong safety. The, those competitions are wrapped up as, as far as I'm seeing things. And one of the reasons why is because of Jimmy Ward's injury and a couple of uh, plays being made at 49ers training camp next. You're heading out to hang out with your friends. Let, let, let me let me let me just put this picture in your head because I think we've all been there. You're hanging out with some buddies, right? Uh, maybe putting back a few drinks. Uh, a few becomes a few too many. 
And as the evening comes to an end and people start to head out, you think of calling a ride. Nah, yeah, you live close by. You can think of a lot of excuses. You know, your car is there. You don't have to come back and get it the next day. Uh, you're like, nah, I'm okay. I, I'm, I'm totally fine. It's no big deal. What are the odds that you'll get pulled over anyway, right? Even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up. You lose your license. You lose your job. You total your car. You could kill somebody. Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly, and it is absolutely not worth it. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again, play it safe, and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. Okay, Croc. Uh, I want to highlight two camp battles that are over, and that is nickel cornerback. After the release of Darquez Denard, Samuel Womack won the job. Do we both agree there? Like That's the reason they could release Darquez Denard. They released the veteran because they know they're okay with the young guys and they're ready to roll. And you still have, yes. you know, you still have Dante Johnson. Maybe if there's some hiccups there, you still have some veteran players that could come in and filter in. So you feel good about that. And I think part of the reason why Denard got released as well was because he wears a Revo Speedy helmet. And <laughs> once I saw him wearing that, I'm like, this dude's not gonna last too long, sir. That's part oh, of no. as well. Oh no. Uh, and, and strong safety. Hufanga was the favorite coming in, and he's gotten the initial first team reps. And uh, we've seen some other players filter, and we've seen more get some reps. We've seen Odom get some reps at strong safety. But one thing that's happened is now with the hamstring injury for Jimmy Ward, and now his week one is sort of in doubt. And we'll see how long it takes for Jimmy Ward to recover from that hamstring injury. Now we're seeing Tarverius Moore and Odom. Odom, who had an interception against uh, Kirk Cousins and the Vikings in that joint practice today. Now we're seeing them at free safety. And it's even added to the level of, oh, yeah, so strong safety's done. Now let's work on our depth at free safety. Hufanga won the job, right? So the starters are done. We know who the starters are, aside from injury, at all 11 positions on defense. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And and again, that's saying that. Well, no. One caveat, and that's Jason Verrett. Well, that's no, not Jason Verrett. Jason Verrett's going to come back. Who, I don't know who is 100% starting opposite Nick Bosa. Bosa, by all accounts, unblockable against the Vikings. Um, but Bosa had a lot of praise speaking after practice about Kamoko Ture. Kamoko Ture uh, had a really good game against the 49ers. Um, I, I don't think the rookie is going to be necessarily the starter, Drake Jackson, but I think he'll be rotated in in a lot of spots on the defensive line, particularly off the edge. But I still think Samson Abelcom has the lead there, but we have to see how that gets treated the, the next couple of preseason games. I still think snap one, week one, it's going to be Samson Abelcom on the outside. I still think that's the case. But Ture has an argument, and Ture has been a good player in camp. And Drake Jackson, you spent the 61st overall pick on him. I could see him winning that job too. So I guess it's not a lock lock for any of those, but I'd be willing to bet it's Abel Calm, it's Hufanga, and it's Sam Womack. Yeah, that's that's the one though. That's that's the only one where I'm like, ah, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, I, I would assume it be can, but you never know, especially if Drake Jackson keeps doing some cool things. Uh I, I follow someone on social media who actually played at USC with him and he kind of pointed out one of the pass rush snaps from Drake Jackson. And when you kind of slow it down and you hear someone break it down, it's like, uh, yeah, that was kind of cool what he did. He he was beating the left tackle right off the back, and he engaged really good, extended the hands to keep the, uh, the offensive tackle's hands off of him, and then he got the hands off of him so that now they're disengaged. And then a guy was trying to come over and help, but he beat the other guy to the outside so quick and then did a really good job of dipping – that shoulder and beeline straight to the quarterback and he went to go knock the ball out of Jordan Love's hands and just missed it. But when you see a guy like like win the way that he did, even while they're trying to double team him, albeit against backup tackles, I'm sure. But it was it's pretty sweet. It's pretty yeah. sweet. And I think it's next year for Drake Jackson. I think he'll be a rotational guy this year. The next year, if he shows up at a rocked up 265, right? Instead of the you weird. You got to go work with the Boses. Again, I don't yeah. know if they mess with people. I feel like they go. Yeah, they don't want visitors. Yeah. 
It's kind of like when Tom Brady locked Jimmy Garoppolo out of the TV 12. So, uh, <laughs> it, so, but man, it, yeah, Drake Jackson needs to come back at a, at a, you know, a lean and mean 260, 265 and, and be that dude off the edge. I think that's kind of uh, wh- where he should be. Maybe year two for him to really, really break out. But he, there's just things you can't teach that dip around the corner, that play that I think he hurt his shoulder on where he was, um, you know, changing directions with the quarterback, the stop start ability, just the looseness. You see him that backflip he did at practice alone is like dudes can't do that at 270 pounds. Yeah. The height he got on that backflip, I mean, it's just crazy. So you can't. Yeah, I was watching. It, I'm like, damn, did he just do it? I mean, I, he was hanging in the air. It's like I, I looked at someone like, you see that? And when I look back at him, he was still in the air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, did you see the route from? rookie danny gray against the old timer pat pete at practice y- y- yes i did and that was a bomb you know obviously from trey lance who, who a lot of people are like oh that ball is so underthrown and i'm like man look. <laughs> danny gray is flying and at this point okay so a couple of things to take away from that one and this is not me just defending trey lance i'd say this for anybody i'd say this for jimmy garoppolo as well when a receiver really beats a defensive back the goal is not to make the perfect pass. The goal is to get the completion, right? So trying to make the perfect pass, oftentimes you'll see a guy overthrow a player. And we've heard that from Trey. Oh, he's overthrowing guys, overthrowing guys. So, okay, he took a little off. He threw a pass to where his guy potentially could catch a run, but at the very least, we know it's a 40-plus yard gain. I'll take that. All right, so there's that part. Now, Danny Gray. No way in hell is... Uh, Peterson, Patrick Peterson. Yeah. A little bit up there, right? 32 years old now. From off coverage, 32? able to turn and run with Danny Gray. 32, that's it? Yeah, he's 32. I was going to guess he, he was like 35. 35. I just feel like he's been around for so long. But obviously, you know, he yeah, came out. I feel out like really he's one of those guys that came into the league when he was like 20 or something. Yeah. But yeah. he can't turn and run with Danny Gray. So yeah. from off coverage, Danny Gray has a head start on you, and you have to flip your hips, turn and run with him. It's not happening. I felt bad actually for Patrick Peterson because there's there was a time when he could turn and run with the guys, and now he's got this rookie who runs four three, and uh, there was no route. Danny Gray just ran by him and was gone. Yeah, like that, that's all he did. Can't run, and that's difficult. It's difficult. That's difficult for any like defensive back when you have four three getting up on your toes that quick. But it's even more difficult when you're older and can't run the way you used to. And Patrick Peterson was definitely a guy who can turn around with the best of them. Uh, press coverage, he was terrific, all that. I mean, Pat P was amazing, which is weird. I mean, you know, he's like a big corner. He's, he's like the Debo Samuel of cornerbacks. Yeah. He's, he, he measured in, if I'm not mistaken, and we can fact check this, but as a cornerback coming out of LSU, Patrick Peterson measured in at 6'1", 219 pounds. And you just do not 19. see that. 219 for a cornerback. And he was so fluid. He was a great punt returner. I mean, he was a he was a guy that could really run, but you don't see guys that big. Anyways, maybe trying to hold that same type of weight and be able to turn around with guys now is just not happening. Yeah. 61219-43140. That's freakish. Damn. 219. I didn't realize. I knew he was a big guy, but 219 is crazy. 219 is crazy for a corner. 38. I mean, we've seen some, but to be 219. And as fluid as he was, and move as well, and be able to run the way he did. Like that's that's what makes you a top five cornerback. Hold on. So not just 219, 43140, 38 inch vertical, 658 three cone. Which is <laughs> ridiculous. crazy at 219. That's crazy. That that's anyways, nuts. he ain't that anymore. No, so he's not. He's <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, Denny Gray, he you're not gonna be able to run with him from that. So a lot yeah. of people are probably like, Croc, well, what about your analysis? I did get some tweets like, Oh, you said he wasn't like no, listen. I said there was an area where I felt like he needed to improve on. If you play press against him and he has to win on an underneath route, that's an area where I feel like felt like he needed to improve on heading into to being with the 49ers. Now, has he worked on those things, et cetera? I don't know. But there is a clear area where he is winning. And that right. is straight. Like he can oh. run straight fast. And Trey Lance can throw it out there. Yeah. <laughs> like, that and, is and you, clear. And you give him a runway so he doesn't have to do anything even to get open, to get to the point where he can just open up and, and run. Like, he, he just, all he did was just run straight by the dude. Well, I think, too, the, the, the two 
big clips plays we've seen from Danny Gray in the last week, right? Packers, it was off they coverage won. from a slot guy. And a safety. And, it was a safety. Yeah, yeah it was a safety. They, they By the way, the hold on, real won. quick, Croc. So it's very vanilla in preseason games for the most part, but that was – I, I really felt, especially that one play, but I, I think there were some times that Kyle Shanahan was like, look, let's give my young guys a look where they can succeed and let's get some confidence built up here. Because he did, he motioned um, a tight end or a fullback out wide because Danny Gray had the the split that was close to the line of scrimmage, right? And he yeah. kind of got that matchup and a one-on-one off coverage against a safety who's now covering your 4-3 guy. So that's a nice little matchup that Kyle Shanahan got his guys uh, in a preseason game that, you know, you're not going to see that exactly. You're not going to see that player in the, in, the, in, a, in the regular season game covering you, and you might not see the same look defensively. So good job by Kyle Shanahan there. But both times off coverage by a guy who, doesn't, who can't run with Danny Gray, giving him a free runway to run by you. Yeah, can't happen. Can't happen. Last note from camp, which was uh, uh, from practice against the uh, the joint practice against the Minnesota Vikings, was Trey Lance making a play on, uh, I guess it was a quote-unquote fourth down play where uh, he was forced out of the pocket and made a throw across his body. Nice play to a 30-yard gain to Debo Samuel, which by all reports, Debo Samuel looking like he's getting his legs under him and, uh, and, and getting that mid-camp form now, starting to make a lot more plays in practice. So, um kind of bringing it back to what we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, a little worried about the offensive line, a little worried about the timing with Trey Lance, but he can clearly make a play. And when he gets out, we saw it last year and we're seeing it in training camp and in practices this year, he can still make a play. And he did that today with Debo Samuel. So that's a good sign. He's a playmaker. Trey Lance is a playmaker. And so is Debo Samuel. Uh, More reports from the final day of Joint practices will start previewing that Minnesota Vikings 49ers preseason week two game as well on tomorrow's show. I think we're going to go to go live Thursday evening to uh, to do that. And we'll have a lot of fun with you folks So jump on with us around, um, I don't know, 4 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern time to join up with the Locked On 49ers live on tomorrow's episode. We'll talk about camp. We'll preview 49ers vikings this weekend croc and i will talk to you then right here locked on 49ers